Hello everybody, and thanks for checking in on this uh, Camp Studio Recorder uh, webinar that's going to try to cover a whole bunch of different bases on how to use the Camp Studio Recorder. We're going to cover uh, the various types of regions that you have available in this latest version of Camp Studio, the 2.6 beta which is exhibiting a few bugs right now but they're all being squashed very quickly and uh, this uh, is a very stable build at the moment and whereas we used to tell people that for mission critical types of work to go with 2.0 we now uh, do recommend going right to 2.6 because it has features that really make it worthwhile uh, for one thing it's got the window region ability and with that ability, I can select a window and shrink it right to a specific size. Like, say I take this browser window back here, I can make it snap uh, right to a, with this resize reposition, snap right to a 1270 by uh, 720, or 1280 by 720 uh, HD YouTube format and it snaps to it just that fast you see and that's a, a very nice thing because then you can control your window sizes with that now you might have noticed that when I did this selection under resize here I picked a 1279 by 719 because that's one of the bugs that's being squashed is that it's adding, Camp Studio has been adding a pixel to the screen measurement when you use this program, which is called Sizer, by the way. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's adding a pixel, so I had to put in my resolution, my, well, my dimensions with one less pixel, 1279 by 719. Like, let's talk about that right away. This, uh, this feature of the window, being able to size windows is so great that I want to show you this program called Sizer immediately. And you just simply type Sizer into a Google window and hit search. And the very top thing you'll find will be the Sizer software by Brian Apps. And when you go there, they're up to 333 at the time of this recording. It works in XP, Vista, and Windows 7. And uh, you just download the installer is the one I recommend. Now when you are running this installer, like I'll go ahead and do that, Let's load her up, download it, and I'll show you how the installer runs. Oh, uh, I can't do it with the thing installed, one second, let me turn this off. There we go. Oh, well it's not letting me upgrade it from here, because I've got it running I guess in the background. But the main thing I wanted you to see was that when you do install Sizer, um, it has a choice to let it start when Windows starts. And that's the best choice to have because this thing actually has a million and one uses. Okay. Another tool is called Zoomit, and that's from TechNet at Microsoft. Type in Z-O-O-M-I-T. And this lets you zoom in on the on a page, and so you just go here to zoom it. You'll see you wind up at zoom it for who? Mark Rusunovich, who's written so many little utilities at Microsoft. Just download that and install it, and it gives you a zooming in capability. And we'll go ahead and open this thing up. We are. And this is basically just a little program that you can start initially, or you can you can put it in your startup uh, thing to start automatically. But pretty much, you only need it when you need it. It's got a little uh, bunch of options. You set what the zoom toggle is going to be. At the moment it's control and one. And um, I'll make it control 
Let's see, control. This is a cruise. Let's see. There we go. Control Alt C. Click OK. And as you see, it zooms the screen in. And you click it again, it zooms it back out again. Wherever your cursor is pointing, that's what becomes the center of the screen. Wherever your mouse is pointing, I should say. So if I want to point out this, that's the functionality I get. And as you move your mouse, the whole screen moves, as you can see. This is very nice because it's one utility that's not built into Camp Studio that gives you that really nice zoom in ability. So again, let's zoom it. And there you have it by Mark, Mark Vucinovich. And of course, make sure that that combination that you're using is a keyboard key combination. is It's not being used by any other program. Uh, Zoom it tries to warn you uh, that if it's interfering with something that you've already got in the system, and we'll say that that's being used. But if you've got any that you've already put in, it could override some that are just built into other programs. So you might get a surprise if you open up that program, say Photoshop or something. And but I found that many programs will override the system ones before uh, you know, they'll override any other settings as long as they're the the main window so you might have to worry about it might not but if you want to use zoom it with that program you'd better have the uh, shortcut keys matched up so that you're not running into problems with conflicts okay so there's zoom it sizer has a um, little configuration tool and I've gone and stopped it now so let's bring up sizer and down on the right you'll see that it's got a small icon you right click on it and you click on configure sizer and here's where you put in the different dimensions that you want to use in fact hey what a great use for this so there you have the different dimensions that you put in you create a new one by clicking on the add button right there it adds 640 by 480 you go in and edit it the first field is just a description field so say I wanted to do uh, 960 by 480 or by 720 for a uh, 48 and that's meaningless so here you gotta set this stuff in here and um, you can have it move directly to the center or the left or the right or anywhere you want bottom right or you can have a defined position that's defined in pixels okay so say you wanted it to you knew you were going to be using this window and you had to show your tray um, then you could have it automatically move to the right to the bottom right so now that that's in there I would just click on OK and so now let's shrink this browser window and we'll go to here and you see bingo it moves it down creates this window this size moves it down so I'm able to encompass this area down here now the thing is is that when you're actually using cam studio with this and you click on region window and you start cam studio it asks you to click on a window to be captured the window you click on becomes the size that it uses. However, I'm using the microphone so it's going to yell at me. And I also had made this thing a wrong size so I didn't compensate for that pixel. Remember that? So it refuses to record it. If I, on the other hand, go with a dimension that has already had the compensation put in, or I could change this so it did compensate. Then Cam Studio has no trouble, except it will yell at me about the wave in. So there we go. It's clicking right in and recording. It's reporting dimension 1279 by 719. However, when the actual recording's done, it'll be 1280 by 720. Okay, stop this and dismiss it. All right, so I wanted to at least quickly cover that uh, 
those two tools. Any got any questions? Anyone? Okay. Well, let's see now. The other big deal, of course, is the fixed region thing. If you don't want to use window, go into fixed region and set in. This does not have this does not have that pixel over you know the added pixel bug. And like I say, that added pixel bug is going to be a common non-issue very very soon. But this doesn't have that. So if I put in 1280 by 720. Everything's just fine. Now I can make it so it's fixed at a top, for instance. So I have it, uh, say, 100 picks from the top. And then when I start the recorder, well, you can't see because you're not seeing the flashing screen. Let me get flashing to work. There we go. So I start the recorder, and it'll... Can you see these little squares? This square here, a square here, and the square on the outside. So let's stop that. There we are. I see. It was moving it over 100. I wanted it to stay zero. It automatically put that in for me. Thanks a lot. So because this is 1280 wide, I would have to have my left B zero, but if I want it that hundred down from the top, then I have a hundred here. It just went and auto filled in the hundred for me, I guess. So again, let's see. Here now we're talking. So there's my green there, green there. I hope you can see these. And that's showing the the uh, actual recording region down from that's down a hundred pixels from the top, and there. I could have just chosen centered. But there's some cases where it's nice to have it show up at a precisely the right place. For instance, when I do some Photoshop things, I don't like bothering with my screen real estate of the toolbar where it says, you know, Photoshop at the top. I like that to be right above where my recording area is. So all I'm actually recording are my menu areas. So that's a really good application of setting a fixed region rather than using a window. Or you can set up another window in advance that's positioned correctly and use that by positioning that window using a size or configuration. Because this lets you do custom, you know, defined positions. You simply would fill it here, be 100, and then the left be 0, in the same way that I did under exact position. So, um, and then it would take that and have it at the right place. Let's do a check, and there you have it. So it's moved it 100, okay? So this would be a great time to, um, to see how that would work in my favor. Say, since I see 100 was too much. Oh, that was center, actually. Let's do it at about 80. 70, 79, okay. And there we go. So that's uh, just about at the mark that I'm hiding the top. I'm recording like right underneath here. So uh, it could go for a little bit, a little bit better, but you get the idea. The idea would be to have it automatically position a window. So when I click on it, I'm not bothered with the top part. Okay. So, so between sizer and or the region using the region command, you have a lot of different options. So let me turn that off. Again, cancel out. Saving it. Now, you can drag a region by just selecting this. And this is how most people used to make recordings. But now everybody's going for HD stuff. Plus, they're using codecs that require that the width and height be a multiple of two. And so just dragging out a region using that is a little bit risky. You can get away with it with, like, uh, Camp Studio Lossless Codec lets you be any pixel dimension. Sure, until you upload it to YouTube. And now, because YouTube is using the uh, MPEG-4 as its standard, well, guess what? MPEG-4 requires the uh, recording be 
width and height that's a multiple of two or divisible by two. And so this starts becoming a real problem. That's why I'm addressing these fixed region and window regions and sizer and everything for you because so many people have had their videos upload to YouTube and come out all skewed, uh, meaning it looks like the horizontal hold has gone off on an old TV set. And it is rescuable if you use a program like Virtual Dub where you have a crop command, a crop filter they call it, in the, uh, in the full, um, full editing, full processing mode. And then you can actually crop the video to add a pixel in or subtract a pixel to get it so it's divisible by two. And then it'll upload just fine. So there's a nice rescue for you. And let me show you that program. Virtual Dub is another one. It's at virtualdub.org. And as he says, proof he had too much free time in college. Yeah. But I'll tell you, this program is pretty killer dealer. It's available in 32-bit and 64-bit. Though there aren't a whole lot of filters made yet for the 64-bit version. You're probably better off working in 32-bit at this point. But uh, it'll come up to speed in a while. This program lets you do a lot of things, like the cropping. It lets you rescue programs that go over the AVI1 limit, which is what uh, Camp Studio records with. And Camp Studio will crash if you try to go over that limit. Um, it's not the audio and video together that are so limited, but it, although t that is limited. I mean, if you make your audio file too big and you wind up with something around 3 gigabytes in size, it will crash Camp Studio. It will go ahead and compile the, the video and give you a video, but the video will be unreadable, not even virtual double loaded in. Then you have to go to a program like any video converter. And for that, you just type in any video converter. And you'll see it's, it's for video free. It's the very first one. And this program will even rescue a uh, corrupted um, program, uh, corrupted video that came out of Camp Studio. Uh, and there's many corrupted videos, especially if you go over uh, two gigabytes in the actual video size, the video itself. Sometimes you can get away with using virtual dub and it'll do a rescue. Even though it'll give you a bunch of error messages, it finally does rescue the video. But uh, that probably should be a whole webinar just on how to rescue oversized videos. However, if that's just to not make a video that goes so oversized that it needs rescuing. And as long as you're keeping it down to two or three hours uh, in your length, you can record a full-blown audio, 16-bit audio, and thus use the MCI to record, which is right here. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Under Audio Options, right here, if you check Use MCI Recording, you're recording the system audio, which is 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz sampling. That system audio, it's a really big file. The WAV file winds up much bigger than the video file in many cases. However, the synchronization stays so tight, and you don't have to worry at all about things getting out of sync. And that when you point at something and click, that it really is, the click happens when you click. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's not drifting out of sync. Using most of these compressor formats, as I found lame especially, made the, made the audio drift all over the place. The lag got worse and worse. When you got up to 10 minutes, it was already incredibly noticeable. Oddly, uh, something I didn't expect, the Microsoft ADPCM, which is a really old codec, um, that thing works good in stereo or mono. And seems to stay in sync, even with really long videos. So that's worth a try, but do some experiments with it. That's again, here, I, so I got this right here, Microsoft AD PCM. Another one that works, if you keep things in mono, and you would set the mono up here, go up to pick a mono, um, like 
that's 16 bit and when you pick the mono up here all of a sudden you get another compression format called GSM 6.1 that's loaded in with any Microsoft uh, operating system it's the same GSM you heard of with telephones it's the, uh, it's the compression standard and that also makes very very tiny audio files with a uh, pretty good sound and it seems to hold the sync according to reports I haven't tried it myself I only just discovered about this uh, the other day on the forums they, somebody told me so so the best thing to do is to either use one of those GSM which is reportedly as I say keeping synchronization very very well in mono so if you're using a microphone and no other stereo, you know, not a stereo source, then this is fine. Or if you're going to use stereo, and you can go down in uh, the size of, I say, just go with 16 bit, then you have the Microsoft ADPCM, which I've done some tests and it's held the um, synchronization very, very well. If you just don't want to take a chance, go ahead with use MCI recording. Needs to say, if you're using one of these compression formats, uh, either ADPCM or the other one, do not have this checked where it says use MCI recording, because this checkbox overrides anything that you selected in here or up here. It forces it to be system system uh, audio. All right, just so you know. Uh, interleave is actually, I have found it to not matter very much when it comes to synchronization. I've tried it both ways. As long as I use system audio, I get really good synchronization. Okay, but one thing you want to just want to keep in mind is this system in Cam Studio seems to be based on a one second, a thousand milliseconds type of a thing. So something that's in the tens base when it comes to milliseconds um, is a good idea or you can switch to frames and have it be so many frames where it's interleaving. In other words, it's really not that big a concern as it turns out when it comes to keeping synchronization. Now then, as long as we're talking about synchronization, I should cover some settings that you need to have that are crucial in the video options here. So let's bring up our video options. See, I'm at XVID right now because I've been using that a lot as, a, as my standard. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. But first, let's just cover some of these settings. The set keyframes every, the capture frames every, and the playback rate. These three are crucial. And these two right here are absolutely crucial for keeping synchronization. When you multiply these two numbers together, they have to equal 1,000. So that makes only certain settings viable. And the reason for this is because of that 1,000 millisecond base that is going on behind the scenes in the way Camp Studio is doing your recordings. And the fact that you cannot enter a decimal in here. So I can't put in for, um, for a 30 frames per second, I can't put in a decimal value up here that'll come up to be a nice even 1000. The best I can get out of it, and I'll use the auto adjust, is that 33. I need 33.33333 to do 1000. So, so since I don't have decimals capability, although that's likely being added in a future release pretty soon, uh, playback rates of 30 and 33 aren't possible because you still got to be able to multiply these two numbers together to be a thousand. So that brings us down to which ones are possible. Well, playback rate of 10 capturing frames every thousand milliseconds or every tenth of a second is fine for most tutorial type videos like something like a, a webinar video like you're watching would be just great. And uh, it's going to be a little bit jerky in terms of the mouse movement. You'll if you're really watching, you can see that there's some, like, stepping or hesitation. Everything's staying in sync, though, and it's only that it's only capturing every tenth of a second. And that is barely noticeable by us, because if, you know, our eyes and brains are very good, sharp, and can catch that. Um, 
So the next faster speed for a smoother result would be to have it be playback rate of 20 frames a second. Now that's getting pretty imperceptible. Just realize that you have to capture frames every 50 milliseconds so that 50 times 20 equals 1,000, see? So again, another one would be 25, get a little smoother, and then you'd have to catch it 40 every 40 milliseconds. When smoother yet, you're going to have to jump all the way up to 50. What am I saying? Up to, up to 40. <laughs> and at 40 frames a second, you're getting pretty smooth, and you capture frames every 25 milliseconds. Now in slower machines, most XP machines and stuff, trying to get 40 frames a second for real out of your unit is, is likely not going to happen. However, it will get, uh, CAN Studio will get the closest to CAN, it will grab frames, and will set its internal playback rate to deliver 40 frames a second from a media player. Well, that's where the set key frames every starts kicking in. What a keyframe is, is when I say every 40 frames, every 40 frames, Cam Studio is going to capture a truly complete frame, an entire complete window, and use that, well, uses it for the seek button when during playback, you know, the little bar, the progress bar that you can click on and it jumps to a portion of the video. It uses it for that. So if you have this too high a number, it makes it can make seek time a little bit strange. It can make it act strange. Um, the highest you can go would be 200. You'll see that that definitely does not uh, work out well. Although 100 works quite well. Okay. Um, what's happening though when you're going in here is that it starts synthesizing frames from the frames that are missed in order to keep up this 40 frames a second if you're not truly capturing 40 frames a second. We used to recommend to people go ahead and try the uh, setting of 200, let's see, it's 200 uh, frames a second playback, which is trying to capture frames every 5 milliseconds. Uh, it takes a real powerhouse computer to be able to actually accomplish that. <laughs> um, highly unlikely your computer is really capable of capturing every five milliseconds and uh, to deliver a playback rate that good. What you see when you're actually doing a recording is that it does its very best. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a little recording, catch, capture a window to be recorded. And you see that on this fairly good machine, my actual input rate with those settings we just had is 29.27, 20, 5, 6. It's trying to move up. It might get to about 30 frames a second of actual capture speed. Okay? So this is the actual input rate. This is what's actually coming in. And so if I, when I stop this recording and save it, the media player, because I told it 40 frames a second, the media player will play back 40 frames a second. But it's synthesizing frames. It's making uh, frames where there weren't any. Okay? Um, virtual frames. In order to fill in the gaps and make it so that everything synchronizes. And stays at that playback rate that you asked. That's why it's not s seeming to speed up anything or slow anything down. To get to this, these uh, different rates. So here, since I had my playback rate set at 200, and I was getting just about 30. That seems to be a good indication at about the maximum this computer is capable of, in spite of the fact that it's a 64-bit machine. All right, it's running in 32-bit mode right now because it's a 32-bit program. But still, it's, that's about the fastest I can expect from this machine uh, at, at this speed, even though it is a quad-core and all that kind of good stuff. That's why I say it takes a real crazy power hitter machine to be able to accomplish even 40 frames a second. Okay. However, this is a viable setting because it's 40 times 25 equals 1,000. Even 50 with 50 times 20 is a viable setting. Okay. You'll still get good synchronization. So 
One problem with setting this too high and pushing my machine to record at the most that it possibly can is that you are stealing resources away from other programs. While I was running that recording, you might have noticed some lag in the uh, GoToWebinar presentation. There might have been some um, deterioration there because this program, the GoToWebinar program itself, is very resource intensive. Um, plus, it's doing a recording of its own in the background. So when I did that, you might have noticed some, um, you know, uh, degradation of the actual presentation there. If, say, you're running a program that's, uh, that's really quite intense, we have quite a few people that try to record gameplay, for instance. Well, you've got to leave some resources up there for the game. So you're going to have to make a compromise in there and go for the smoothest frame rates that your computer can really grab easily, but leave some space behind for the game. Okay? Because it they will start to compete for resources. The Camp Studio and the game will compete for resources. Same thing with any animation program you're trying to illustrate, you know, to give a presentation about. Say you're trying to show an animation in an architectural CAD program, you know, computer-aided design program, or you've got Blender or some other 3D animation thing you're trying to show what it can do. Uh, those are all pretty darn resource intensive. And so you can't have Camp Studio and that program fighting for resources, or you'll see your recordings degrade. And the reason they're degrading is because, not necessarily because Camp Studio isn't capturing as much as it can capture, but because the actual program is having trouble keeping up and it's starting to lag. Okay, so so there you go. There's your uh, little warnings. Again, keep these two in particular. Keep them multiplying to a thousand, and use MCI for recording or the MSADPCM or the GSM. Uh, for the audio portion, and you'll have some good synchronizations there. Now, on another front, is people that are trying to do things like record webinars like this, especially webinars that go on for two and a half hours or so. And uh, about a month ago, um, a, another person at the forums and I went through a whole ton of different tests trying to figure out a way to record even an hour and a half long type of a recording. He was doing lectures that went an hour and a half. Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how much, how many hoops we jumped through trying to get the Cam Studio loss list, which is a nice little codec and everything. But it really wasn't quite up to speed in getting an hour and a half. And uh, in fact, nothing else that we usually used was up to speed for that. Um, Lagareth lossless is a program that's it's a codec that's been used by a lot of people for grabbing gameplay and smooth animations. It works really well with high motion types of recordings. In other words, not something nice and static like this screen where the only thing moving pretty much is my mouse, but things where have a lot that have a lot of motion, full animation, uh, full movement on the whole, where the whole screen basically <laughs> you're capturing the movement, you know, every single pixel on the screen is changing. So some codecs deal with that very, very well. Uh, Lagos Lossus deals with it well, but it does not compress small enough that you didn't overwhelm the 2 gigabyte limit that's imposed by the AVI 1.0 code uh, specification that Camp Studio is still under. Now there is an AVI 2.0 specification and we're working to bring things up to that level where it complies with the AVI 2.0 spec and thus we can go over the 2 gigabyte limit without a problem. But that day has not come yet, although by the end of the summer we just may see such a thing. Um, the big surprise was discovering that XFID is a codec that allows capture of uh, HD screens uh, in other words, 1280 by 720 video, and keeps the video portion so small that we were we've been able to get two and a half to three hours 
of uh, capture, even at its highest setting. And let me show you what I mean. I hit configure here. And as you can see, this version has an XBID HD 720 setting. Now the version that I've got in here right now is made by a fellow named Jawar and he has created a special MPEG-4 but I'm pretty sure the current XBID um, that you find at the regular XBID.org has just added a similar setting of an a HD 720 setting which is 1280 by 720 uh, let me show you the two places where you can go get this XFID codec real quick. Of course, you've got XFID.org. There we go. It comes in uh, various flavors. You simply click on where it says looking for up here, get the very latest version. And you scroll down and you see there's the Windows version right here. And there's two mirrors for it. And uh, so this is, uh, this is where you get it from from the source, uh, the original source. However, XBIT is very, it's an open source thing and it's uh, it's got a lot of nice subtle settings behind the scenes. And one thing that you're seeing when you get into here when I click on configure you see this profiles these profiles can take a lot of tweaking and some of them are standards like this set these are standard MPEG-4s uh, kind of derived from the old DivX uh, various different versions of the DivX uh, codec that's been around for some time but now they're adding uh, different ones. The original intention of XFID was for people who were trying to make good backup copies of their DVDs. So that's where it originally came from, making use for backups. But now that you've got the HD format becoming very prevalent at all those different video sites, um, it's it's becoming popular for use for making videos for up, uploading to the you know not only YouTube but Vimeo and many others as well, okay? So a lot of different people have been tweaking the open source XFID thing to try to get it. Uh, at first, they were tweaking it to get the very best DVD duplications out of things for backup purposes. They were trying to get really good, good copies that, that caught all the subtleties of the darks and lights really well and stuff. And if you go to the doom9.org forums, you'll see people debating endlessly about the different aspects of these profiles and the different tweaks that you can do to them. Uh, one fellow, though, has gotten some some fame for his tweaks, and that would be uh, Jawar. And that's it, Jawar Matt. I'll bring you up on this. It, J A W O R M A T dot Republica with a K dot P L slash XFID dot HTML. And I've got an article at the screencast tutorials dot org website that's uh, talking all about this. Which you can look up um, at this site. You go home, open up. There we go. And you see I've got a whole article about this. Um, this particular codec that he's come up with, he's got a 32-bit and 64-bit binaries. Now, I'll tell you, it's nice to have both in your system because it means your 64-bit media player uh, in Windows 7 can can use this XFID codec. However, don't just put this 64-bit in, put the 32-bit in because programs like Windows Movie Maker and stuff, I'm pretty sure Windows Movie Maker is still a 32-bit app. So, um, many, many, most programs, uh, virtual dub, you name it, are still 32-bit apps. So for them to see this codec, you've got to also have that 32-bit binary in. So don't go get all excited because you just bought a 64-bit machine 
and you say, oh, oh, great, I can use the 64-bit one. I'm free at last from the 32-bit. No, you're not. You're not free from 32-bit at all. That'll be several years. Uh, most programs are still written in 32-bit. And they need the 32-bit codex as a consequence. So, um, this installer, he has tweaked everything, so now you get both of them uh, in one package. It installs the 32-bit and 64-bit and includes his tweaks that make uh, make it easy and the, as I said, the one-stop shopping to pull up under configure the uh, XVID HD720, which is what most people are using for an HD format right now, mostly because of the power of computers, not only for recording, but also for playback. Don't forget when you're Making a video, you got to be in consideration of the people who are going to be watching it too. And about the best you can expect is that people will be able to watch uh, in HD 720. Although some people's machines are fast enough to watch the new 1080p, you know, HD. That still takes quite a powerful computer just to play it back, just to watch it, uh, without it being lagging and sticking and seeming like it's flashing in front of you. Um, now, one nice thing that YouTube does do is that it encodes a high-quality video. So if you did make a 1080 even and uploaded it, it gives people the options of watching the uh, degraded versions at the lower resolutions and lower screen sizes so that it still will match their computer. And it doesn't do a really terrible job of delivering those lower uh, screen sizes the clarity is still pretty darn good, but the thing with them is that you've got to give them as many pixels as possible. Let me tell you, uploading any kind of length at 1080p is crazy. It takes forever, even if you've got a double speed upload thing from what most people give. If you go with 500, uh, or even if you went at a mega, you know, at, at, um, a mega uh, per minute. It's still going to take forever to upload it to YouTube. This is just a nice compromise for people's sanity and their time, and it works with just about all machines. And so that's why uh, I've been recommending this. The big deal is, is that XFID, even with this slider set all the way to the left at 1, which is the highest quality, the maximum quality, it still shrinks down the darn files like you wouldn't believe. If you're, ever, if you're nervous, go ahead. Put two in here instead, and you'll get a little bit of compression and get a little bit of an edge to make a larger file. I mean, a, a longer file, but still keeping a small enough file size. But um, but here we are talking about a limitation that is primarily on the size of the video, the video component. When you make a recording using Cam Studio, it actually records, and the audio is separate from the video, and then. When you hit stop, it compiles the two together into a single file. It's the video portion that has to stay under 2 gigabytes or everything crashes, theoretically. However, in reality, if you record a 6-hour video and you had the audio at 16-bit and you wind up with this gigantic audio file and so when the two combine, you wind up with a 3 gigabyte file, it usually will not be playable by... Windows Media Player, but like I say, it is rescuable by the Any Video Player, okay? Um, the Any Video Converter. Let's see, where did I put that? Yeah, this, that video converter will convert and rescue things where the, uh, the video is still correct size, but you got up to like 600, you know, a little more than a half a gigabyte or maybe even a gigabyte, but your audio was so huge because you used the MCI for recording that uh, it blew everything up. This is the only thing I know of that will rescue that. I'm sure there's others, but uh, I've tried um, virtual dub won't rescue them uh, and other means that I've tried couldn't rescue them either. This did rescue it, so I'm fine. I can stop here. It's working. If you know of any that uh, that work really well for rescuing oversized API recordings uh, that you've encountered. Go ahead and let me know. I'd love to know, and I'll pass that along at the forums and 
put it up on an article on my website. Okay. Alrighty. So let's see. What else do I want to cover? Big time. Uh, by the way, you see you have more. There's a bunch of settings in here. Uh, wouldn't necessarily worry about changing any of them. Okay, you can change this to MPEG uh, if you just want to. MPEG is the um, quantization type that's being used by YouTube right now, so you can go ahead and change that to that. But um, all the other settings, that's what the profile, the reason you've selected a profile is because it puts all of these settings in here. And until you really know what B-VOPs are and read all those darn forum articles at the Dooms9 forum, you're not going to know what to do in here, <laughs> and so uh, so don't worry about it. That just picking that profile will set up most of the settings you need. Okay, well that's all very well and good, but what about when you want to um, record smaller size files and still got to go uh, a long time? Well, then you can get away with something like Lagarith. Um, Huffy is is okay. They still require the multiple of two. And if you're going to upload to YouTube, I repeat, you're going to have to be a multiple of two in your screen dimensions anyway. And uh, the good old Camp Studio lossless codec. Now, again, the lossless codec, the Camp Studio one, is intended for videos like this where you have fairly static screens that don't show a lot of motion. They're called low motion recordings, where most of the screen is just staying still. Well, so guess how the codec does its thing. It just repeat, it makes little it encodes all the parts that don't move and just repeats them over and over again. Sort of like a zip file does with the spaces in a text document or takes all the Z's and plops them into one file and says this is where all the Z's are going to go when you decompress it to here, 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 here. Just kind of compresses everything into here's the same co this, this singular item, the Z or this space is going to go into these different locations when you uncompress it. So this is sort of like a zip file for video. It's not complicated. It doesn't take into account all kinds of predicting the motion and stuff like that that higher end codecs do like Xvid, DivX, Lagarith, uh, Huffy. These are all high end uh, codecs that were made to capture high motion video. Even Microsoft Video One, as much as it gets put down, is not the worst thing in the world when it comes to high motion video. It just introduces a lot of artifacts when you try to use it at too high a compression. This, the newer codecs are such higher quality, and in particular, Huffy, which is what Lagarith is based on, Lagarith, um, or Xvid. Or if you want to buy into getting the real DivX Pro, it's $30 to get a license. And it's also a darn good codec and gives you a lot of capabilities. One thing I will tell you, though, with the uh, darn DivX, I don't know if this still is a problem, but um, their auto-updater was such a problem that you actually had to go in and find the folder in your program files where the auto-update portion of the program was and change the name of the folder, <laughs> put a put an underscore in the beginning of it or something so the DivX couldn't find it because it would lock up your whole CPU with the uploader, you know, with the um, updater program every single time you did anything, it seemed every time I sneezed, it was trying to up, upgrade itself and all my uh, resources in my uh, task manager were going to 100. They may have solved that problem now, but uh, the DivX folks had admitted that there was a problem and um, I imagine they fixed it by now. They might have. It's been about four or five months since I discovered it and figured out what the fix was, which is just to rename a folder so it couldn't find the updater part. Uh, that's the only thing that works, by the way. Just unchecking the box that says automatic updates didn't do you any good at all. Uh, now, there's been a question about whether or not using the MCI for recording Checking this and doing it at 16-bit and then using another program to compress worked out okay. You know, it's a funny thing, but it doesn't always work out to compress um, using another program. I tried the LAME 
uh, which is the MP3 encoder that's kind of open source. It's an MP3-like compressor because MP3 is a licensed something or other. And so LAME is a uh, is a MP3-like uh, encoder for education purposes. And I was very disappointed with how much the sync got thrown off when I took a pure 16-bit 44.1K uh, recording and everything was synchronizing perfectly in it. I ran it through virtual dub, applied lame, and it was pathetic. So it just, the sync just died. I don't know what happened or what I might have done wrong. You know, it could have been something I said wrong or I might have asked for too much. <laughs> no. I did two tests and both of them came out bad and um, it was just, just recently, about a month ago. So there could be more I, uh, more I should know to pull that off. But heck, I was using pretty much the default settings that it was, you know, recommending, going for 128 kilobytes per second, which is a normal, okay FM quality type of a sound quality. And it's still through the sync off. So I'll tell you right now, using it in um, using it in here. See, I have it installed here. Uh, using it in here was just as bad. It was unbelievably terrible. The sync was thrown off so much. It's crazy. So when you click this use MCI for recording, that's the exact same thing as this PCM right here, it's, um, except it's PCM at 44 stereo. Okay. Even if you put this to mono, this uh, having this checked is going to do stereo. You could try doing mono, which of course records one less channel. Um, so it should be half the file size, so it doesn't quite pan out like that. And uh, here we go. But mostly, if you use MCI for recording, uh, it's doing the stereo. Um, like I say, though, you might try unchecking this, setting this here, and making sure PCM is what's selected right there. Now then, um, oh, I'm having some people reporting that the uh, GoToWebinar is, is lagging kind of bad. Well, I'm not sure if that's getting it. It could be the darn transmission of it, too, because to realize this actually goes from my computer through my upload speed <laughs> at, in my uh, my servers up to their servers and then to get through your, their servers to your servers. I can't believe the Internet even works sometimes. But uh, hopefully it's the recording is coming out okay. Um, let's see. All right, now I did want to cover and make an emphasis on the options where you have this record audio from speakers. And a lot of people, especially people recording games or dem doing demos of programs that produce audio, like say you wanted to give a tutorial on how to use Audacity. And so you want, naturally, you want people to hear your voice and be able to hear the sound coming out of the program, right? Or out of the game. Well, this record audio from speakers has been around since the beginning of time here for Camp Studio. And it exploited a feature that was uh, available in many XP machines because a lot of drivers communicated to the audio subsystem through this thing that could be hooked into by Cam Studio, so we could grab the program audio and funnel it directly into Cam Studio. Okay. Well, when Vista came along, they made an improvement to the audio subsystem. Actually, it was a radical, radical change that they made even more radical with Windows 7. It is an improvement, and overall, people in the audio industry who actually have to do use their computer to run recording studios, for instance, you know, with the recording direct to disk, uh, direct to hard drive, 
through various software, they applauded the changes because it meant for much better uh, word sizes and, uh, and clarity of recordings. However, it completely broke this feature. So, um, oh, where'd it go? There we go. There we are. Oh, I can't use that. That's funny. Yeah, I can't. Oh, I see why. There we are. So do not use record audio from speakers, okay? Very, very bad idea. It will not work, and you'll get an error that says, wave out error. And, uh, you know, sometimes it'll beep at you. And, well, anyway, just because you're trying to get a newer machine to do something that was made for really old machines. Even some computers today that run XP with the, with that, subsystem still the, the audio drivers are new they they don't support that old subsystem the same way anymore and they they won't work right so there are even some newer hardware machines out there with XP on them that won't support that old feature okay so how do you get it around it how do you get the audio from speakers well there's a couple of different ways um, I'm on a Windows 7 machine right now so all I can really show you is how you would do it from Windows 7. However, I've got articles on my website to show how to do it with XP, and there's videos on YouTube. I don't know if you know about the video series that I've put out, but um, let's go back to Screencast Tutorial. If you haven't been here yet, screencasttutorial.org has got gobs of articles on it. And um, so you go down here, and you see how to use Cam Studio Tutorial series now available at YouTube. It's one of the articles. A whole bunch of articles here, including uh, recording speakers and mic using Stereo Mix in Windows 7, and how to set sound from Stereo Mix or what you hear in XP. I should retitle that so it specifically says XP. And, uh, and these videos show pretty explicitly how to get the sound from your uh, from your programs into the Cam Studio recording. Now, uh, so I'm not going to cover that in this webinar uh, because the video is nice and short and sweet and to the point, unless I've got some questions uh, for how to make it work that for people that tried that video and it didn't work for them. Anyone? No? Okay. All right, well, uh, it, all of these videos really do explain a lot of good stuff. They show how to install various codecs. And uh, I'm going to be making a new video pretty soon on that uh, XVID discovery. And, um, and probably one uh, on featuring Lagareth also. Oh, featuring, speaking of which, I did not show you where to get uh, Lagareth. Type in L-A-G-A-R-I-T-H. And... There it is, Lagareth Codec Download. And the very first item is Lag's own website. So just go there, and you're on his uh, Lagareth Lossless Codec page. Okay, so uh, he's updating this thing all the time. Notice it's an installer for 32 and 64-bit versions. It installs both 32-bit and 64-bit codecs at the same time. And it's based on the Huffy... Uh, UB codec, and you can read all about it up here. So uh, he he's worked pretty hard to keep this going, and he's constantly updating it and responding to what people uh, you know people's feedback and input. So it's it's always getting updated and upgraded. Just use the regular installer. Don't hurt yourself using the manual installer. There's no need. And he does share the source code freely if you you know, want to see how he's been doing things. Or well, make suggestions for fixing it. Lagos is great for doing high motion recordings in a lossless codec format. Uh, lossless means it doesn't try to make the file any smaller by throwing away any data. Um, a lossless type of a codec tries to apply an algorithm that's kind of reading your mind, trying to determine what you wouldn't notice had gone missing. 
all right, because there was lots of activity nearby or whatever, that because you wouldn't notice this this part, it can get rid of it. All right, that's the theory behind lossless. You see lossless when you see a JPEG. And if you've ever seen really highly compressed JPEGs, you'll notice all these weird artifacts around the edges where it looks like liquid or something is, um, or oil is, is on the edges is making little patterns. Well, you can see weird patterns and strange artifacts in a lossy type of a, uh, type of a codec also. That's one of the things people don't like about the Microsoft Video One is that, sure, it could capture um, some high motion or low motion, but it would make the edges so loaded up with strange artifacts and make these strange little blocky things. Even in pure white space, it would make these little gray squares show up all over the place. And, uh, you know, trying to anticipate what you won't notice, unfortunately, not, most lossy program, uh, lossy codecs didn't used to anticipate that very well. The newer lossy codecs like XVID and DivX do a darn good job of making that determination and that's why there's so much discussion about making it better and better still to this day. Okay. Lagrith is like the Cam Studio lossless codec in that it doesn't do anything like that. So if you're making something that's going to eventually be brought into a high-end video editing suite to uh, be converted to something for broadcast or for uh, high-end HD 1080p. Well, heck, I mean, you can record it, Lagarith at 1080p right from the get-go. But the thing is, if you were recording at a smaller size and you would have to resize up later on, because it's lossless, you wouldn't be increasing the size of artifacts, making them more noticeable, see? Um, you have something that's nice and pure but that hasn't lost any of its data. All its data is intact. So if you're having to resize it up, you're getting the least number of problems. If you had to apply sharpening or anything like that, you're not sharpening gleck and garbage and, you know, artifacts. So you're getting a good, a good result. Okay, so, um, so there's Lagarith. Like I say, good for high motion. Uh, this was originally discovered by uh, a user named Digiday who was just trying to record a smooth renditioning of from Google, uh, not Google Maps, but uh, Google Earth. Google Earth lets you record these animations of like um, tours where it will, in an animated fashion, move from one geographical land landmark to another landmark, you see, and you can program which landmarks it's going to go to, and it makes this nice animated transition from one spot to the next, and none of the codecs that we were trying were giving good results for that at all, and he stumbled upon the Lagarith and turned me on to it at the forums, and so um, this has been working really well for a lot of people, for game recording, for other animation recordings, and so I can definitely highly recommend it. Now XVID works well for this kind of stuff too. It is a lossy codec however, but you know, lossy or not, if you're trying to record a really, really long, long, long thing, then you don't care uh, about losing something and XVID becomes a godsend because you can, it compresses the size of the video down so much. All right, so what might be my recommendations then for recording a really long thing again? It would be to use the XVID binaries. And now because the, um, because the audio portion, if you go over three hours, can become a problem, uh, I would say go ahead and don't use MCI for recording just for those instances. Choose a compression format in stereo of Microsoft ADPCM, which automatically uses this 4-bit sliding algorithm at 22. Or switch over up here to a mono, say 44K mono. Then when you pick that, you'll have the GSM610. And 
it also makes incredibly small files. So do some tests with both. You'll find that both of those make a really tiny audio file. Xvid is making a really tiny video file. And you'll be able to record incredibly long sessions, even with pretty high motion. Now, of course, the more motion you're putting in there, the more you're working that codec. So the file sizes are going to get big. So when you're doing tests, always do tests with similar types of content that you're planning on doing your recording with. So if you're going to be recording something with a lot of motion, definitely do your tests with something that's going to have a lot of motion. Okay? If it's going to just be a webinar, then, uh, well, you can pretty much just take it from me. I can get three hours out of XVID in, even at six, even with using MCI recording. Okay? We haven't had anybody do a test going for a six hour recording yet um, using the uh, Microsoft ADPCM or um, the GSM. And there are other ADPCMs. There's the IMA. But, uh, but those two have been rock steady for most people in keeping the sync. I would go ahead and maybe even do a test. Um, in fact, make a note of, mental note of that to do a test and run a nice long, long recording and see if the synchronization stays up and, uh, and it doesn't crash. That's always really useful to have it not crash. All right, so uh, what else was I planning on speaking on? Oh, yes, up here in Windows 7, the volume button doesn't take you anywhere. You can click it to your heart's content. It's not going to open anything. That's because of the huge differences in the audio subsystem that's in Windows 7. Um, you have to use your regular uh, box down here, open up your devices and uh, and make your changes up here under playback and recording okay if you're going to record sound from I give you the real short version of this getting sound from a program if you're recording going to record sound from the program stereo mix you right click on it and click on sit as default device okay go in and set its levels all the way up uh, if you want, going to want to talk, you double click your microphone or line in. Say it was a microphone. Well, I have it disabled. And you go to listen. Click on listen to this device and make absolutely certain that it sends it to speakers because Stereo Mix actually derives its signal from the speaker's subsystem. Okay? The speaker out subsystem. So if you're going to put your mic into the loop, you got to have this and selected and have speakers selected. And under playback, you've got to have, see I'm on headphones right now, you've got to have speakers selected as the default device. It must be. It makes a little bit of a headache because unless you've got a real tech or something that'll pass your mic or something out to the headphones, you can't be using the headphones while you're recording from uh, stereo mix. You've got to be sending everything through the speakers. So this has to be the default device, or don't work. It will not work. Um, you also uh, can't just say to monitor this, to listen to this, because you will get a weird echo if you listen to this, even if you try to send it to your headphones. Okay? You will hear the strangest echo. So anyway, that video I showed you, covers that okay but I just wanted to really quickly since as long as I'm in here I'll show you that uh, even after you make those settings you still got to come in here and make sure that this is set to the right thing to line to your mic default input device or line in or stereo mix or microphone okay so you got to still make sure the cam studio is set correctly up here or it won't get the audio from the right place one nice thing is that it does seem to know what you set as default device, and when you come back in here, it's already it's already highlighted correctly. All right. Okay. Let's see. Uh, other things. So, so now you have. Hope you're getting the gist of it. We're always using record audio from microphone. 
and that is a, a permanent feature of getting sound from anywhere, whether it's from stereo mix or from a microphone or from both. You use record audio from microphone, uh, record audio from speakers, even if you have an XP machine. Well, you can try it, but it's kind of deprecated and broken. It doesn't work on so many machines that I would just say don't even try. Okay. Um, and uh, then you check your audio options under audio options for microphone. Don't even go to audio options for speakers. And don't even go to audio and video synchronization. All this was was a way of adding some time to the front or back. You see, you shifted uh, that if it was a little late or a little early, you could change the time shift by so many milliseconds. It, did, it was a makeup for the fact that people back in the day didn't realize why it was lagging, and so they did this shifting thing trying to make up for it. But since it was a lag that got worse and worse over time, because it was kind of stretching a rubber band, it wasn't a linear change with a stiff item, like just where two rulers were not lined up. This was a rubber band thing where the thing got worse and worse over time. It started out sounding sort of in sync, but then would get worse and worse and more and more out of sync. So if you adjusted it using this for a, as how bad it sounded that 10 minutes later, well, the beginning of the video would be out of sync. <laughs> so all you're doing is changing where the out of sync was worse, so you, you couldn't ever get it in sync. The best approach was just to do, like I said, set the, so that these two, so they always equal a 1,000. And then use the MCI for recording, um, or use a compression format like MS80PCM, or in mono mode. Here we go. Select uh, the GSM and try that too. So you got those two choices. All righty. So. Uh, we have a question as to what output format does the Camp Studio make the videos, and that's that AVI, AVI format. Um, it's AVI is one of the original video specifications. Uh, there's now, like I say, an AVI 2.0 spec that it allows to go past the 2 gigabyte size limit. That was a size limit imposed by the 1.0 specification. Camp Studio still uses the 1.0 spec. Uh, it will be using the 2.0 spec, but we have to do a bunch of upgrade dates to the libraries that it uses, and and there's some concern about the backwards compatibility. Okay, uh, because it's AVI, there's a couple of different ways that you got to go, you know, through to convert it to MPEG-4. The easiest way, of course, is just upload a video to YouTube. And then when you go into YouTube, uh, you'll see there's a download link for your videos. And you can download it, and the download, lo and behold, is an MPEG-4, MP4 thing. So now you're letting somebody who has a really, really good transcoder uh, do your work for you. And all it took you was the time to, that it took to upload the darn video to YouTube and then download it again. It does take a long time to upload to YouTube. So let me show you where... Um, where this is. Here we go to my page. <laughs> there we go. My videos. And you see this little drop down right here? has download mp4 right there. It lets you download the mp4 conversion. All of these were recorded in AVI using Camp Studio. Everything that you see on here recorded using AVI. I uploaded it. Now I get an HD format in MPEG-4. So I just simply have to go here to YouTube. Go ahead and zoom in on that. And you see there's that download mp4 is the bottom thing. Again, what I clicked on was this this arrow right there, okay, that arrow right next to where it says Insight, and then at the bottom it shows the download MP4 thing. So that's one way. Now, 
there used to be a 15 minute uh, video limit on YouTube uploads, but recently they've been rolling out a uh, change in policy that, is, according to them, as long as you haven't broken any of their rules in the past, you suddenly go up there and you discover that you, instead of having a 15 minute limit, you have a 2 gigabyte limit or something insane. Okay? We, I mean, good grief, 2 gigabytes, that's the AVI specification limit already. And we're able to go way under that using XVID. Uh, three hour video with XVID is only a little over half a gigabyte. It's about 650 um, megs. So, so uh, you just have to go to your, your thing and see what it's letting you upload now. They've been just randomly, it seems, suddenly just bestowing permission on people to upload these uh, up to two gigabytes and it'll tell you up in here see where it says the little features the little announcements when you go to your page you'll see if you have an announcement there that's of, of how long a video you're allowed to upload and uh, when on the day that they bestow it and I think it stays up there until you click on this um, the little X here so uh, anyhow um, yeah, all you can do is go there and see what your new limit is. It was 10 minutes. They upped it to 15. That lasted about a month, and they started rolling out this uh, this 2 gigabyte limitation instead. So as long as you compress your video enough, you can get tons and tons of time and upload it to uh, to them, as long as you're under that 2 gigabytes in size and file size. And that's total file size. Okay, so that said... The other uh, solution, again, though, is to uh, use the Any Video Recorder. This thing is great. Let me just bring it up. I actually have it in here. Here we go. Couldn't get easier to use. You click on here where it says Add a Video, and uh, pick your video out. Uh, they let you change it for mobile phone to flash, a bunch of different formats, DVD movie. Uh, they'll let you download directly from here. You, you put a YouTube or Google video uh, URL and download the video to convert it for you. You select from this thing. I've got it showing all the different types, but you can just show video, audio, or mobile phone, or burn DVD types of profiles. Right now it's showing them all. Um, I made one for 1280, uh, somewhere around here. But the thing is, no, I didn't have to for this. I made that for another thing. Um, you can say customize AVI, WMV, or customize MPEG-4. So say I was going to go that. Then I select down here, in these boxes down here, and I can select a whole bunch of different options. Uh, in terms of the video codec, see it gives me X264, MPEG-4, or XVID. Um, different sizes. Okay, you go with your original in most cases. But well, you can resize it to be anything you want. Down to 160. That's tiny. Down to 160 by 112. Um, so, uh, and it's giving you little, little clues down here as to what you got as far as uh, when you click on a thing. Video codec, it explains, choose video codec. Now, is that a help file, a help box, or what? Um, you can specify a start and stop time. Um, like, for instance, I recorded a webinar just yesterday, and I forgot to turn off Cam Studio, and I wound up with this gigantic thing that I had to convert to save it, to salvage it, because I went over three gigabytes because of the audio portion was so big. That's one thing about 16-bit audio, it doesn't care if it's recording silence, it records it as a full 16-bit recording of silence. And uh, so the file got really big, it went over 3 gigs. Windows Media Player couldn't salvage it, but this thing did salvage it. Now, um, I'm not sure how many of these codecs appear on installation of this program. Uh, question just came up. Uh, you know, if I didn't have XVID or any of these others installed, uh, would they show up? And I'm not sure. I don't know what if this 
installs codecs with it or not. But that's not necessarily that big a deal. You know, let's go to another location and uh, type in here K Lite K dash L I T E. There you go, K Lite codec pack. And uh, even though there's a 64 bit, you can put that in, but again, the programs you're using are most likely 32 bit. So if you get the 64 bit codecs, that'll allow Windows Media Player to play your things. Uh, the, in Windows 7, which is a 64-bit Windows Media Player. But, uh, but it won't let you use Can Studio or any video recorder or any of these others that aren't 64-bit programs, okay? Um, so anyway, I just go K-Lite Codec Pack and then type in here Mega if you really want to get everything, and, including the kitchen sink. And, uh, and you see it's a codec guide uh, is one place. Free Codex is another place. I think I usually get my stuff from freecodex.com. Um, they don't they don't throw any junk in your computer. No, it's not adware or spyware, any kind of junk. So codec, free, freecodex.com has been a good reliable place. I see they're up to 7.1. And right at the top you just click on download K-Lite make a codec. And there's a whole installer video in that set of videos I showed you earlier that explains how to um, do the installation of this. Uh, the gist of what I tell you is I tell you not to install every darn codec in this package. <laughs> install just what you know you'll need, especially in the um, the uh, go ahead, I'll go ahead and run this especially in the realm of the codec that you're installing for producing videos. I mean, you know, put a bunch in that you know you'll need for playing back videos, if you know you're going to need them. However, the ones that you need, and the reason why I went for the Mega and not the basic of the K-Lite Kodak, or the standard, basic and standard, um, don't have the production codecs, the ones that you need to actually do the compression part of the word codec, because codec stands for compressor decompressor, C O D E C, you know, compressor decompressor. Here we go. Let's pull this up. And so uh, the Mega has all of the possible um, compressors as well as tons of decompressors. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll just walk you through this a little bit quickly. Do an advanced install. And unless you really think you'll need Media Player Classic, some people like it, I don't know. Just don't don't go there, you know. Don't do Profile 7, lots of stuff. Do a custom selection. In fact, maybe deselect all. <laughs> and go through and carefully select what you're going to put in that you know you'll need. Heck, I've already got XFID. What do I want to put that in again for? You know what I'm saying? Um, down here near the bottom are the ones that you need for actually producing videos. They're called VFW, Video for Windows Video Codec. VFW, Video for Windows. And this will put in a bunch of things. I don't think VP7 is ready for prime time. You can put Huffy in there. I don't think you'll need YV12. Some people like it, though. I, Intel to I-263, I totally doubt you're going to want to use that. So just put in the ones you know. However, Lagrith, I can get that from the from the source of the program. So why would I want this to be installed from here? Is it going to be as current? I would imagine, you know, why take a chance? Uh, XVID, same thing. I'm going to go for Jawar's version because I know it's got all the tweaks and improvements uh, that I would like to have. So. Uh, DivX 3.11. No, I don't want this old DivX. This is an old DivX. If I'm going to get DivX, I'll pay for it. Thank you. It's 20 bucks, and I'm done, and I get all the upgrades for free. I mean, good grief. If I want DivX, I'll buy it. I won't use an old deprecated version that's only in there because it's so old. Okay. Um, FFD Show is a good uh, interface for making EPEG-4. Uh, X264 a lot of people have had a lot of luck with, so go ahead and get something like those. 
So you see, look, at it, just from talking about it, I've already cut down a whole lot of these. I, the others I'm saying I will go to the source, I'll go to Lagarith, I'll go to uh, Xvid and get Jawars, I'll get Jawars Xvid. Um, same thing with these down here, the audio codex, ACM. Here you have a couple of different MP3s, uh, a DivX, uh, Windows um, audio type of a thing. Don't think you need that unless you really think you'll be working with people that can play back Vorbis. I wouldn't bother encoding in Vorbis. But these are the audio codecs, okay, for squeezing stuff down. However, the only audio codex I've played, and, and AC3, the only audio codex I've played with that didn't throw the synchronization off were those old ones, the Microsoft ADPCM, which is like ancient, and yet it didn't throw anything off. And uh, same thing with that GSM, which is more recent, but GSM is uh, another standard thing that comes with Windows already, so you don't have anything to install. See what I'm saying? So here I pull up this program for you, K-Lite Mega Codec Pack. Yeah, Mega, but don't put everything you see in here into your machine. It just, it's just filling it up with stuff. Get what you need. Hit next. Get out of there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I will tell you. Um, yeah, there we go. See, these are all already installed. And... Uh, Ta-da. Um, this thing usually comes checked already. It looks like they've started on checking it where they forced you to visit the web page. Good. It's on check now by default. How nice. And uh, hides the stray icons is also another good idea. Then you hit next and do it. So, so I'm exiting that setup. I think I showed you enough on that. But, uh, but that will put these options in there for the program, for programs like any video player, uh, for virtual dub, um, Windows Media, uh, Windows Movie Maker, so that they can see these codecs and use the codecs to uh, process your videos. Okay. Now you will need um, playback versions, and uh, so like I say, don't ignore all those playback versions that were in there in the codec in the K-Lite codec pack. Um, get the ones that you know you'll need. But most of these codec installers uh, that we talked about with Jawars and uh, Lagarith and all those install the playback and the recording codecs together so that your media players and your other recording software can find them. With that said, I've heard some Sony, uh, Sony, oh darn, what is that? There's an editor that's really popular made by Sony, and I just slipped my mind what it's called. And some people have had trouble with that thing, um, uh, seeing all the codecs sometimes. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't own the software, so I haven't been able to troubleshoot that one. That's just something I've seen drifting around through the forums. Okay, so, so there's codecs um, covered for you in a huge way. So you have... And those codecs that are installed show up in here. Now, there's one codec that's not showing up in this version, two, which is the R294 version, the most recent version. It's stable in many, many ways, but a lot of people are fans of one of the codecs that was in there. was called FFD Show, and that's an MPEG-4 uh, codec. And it doesn't show up in the list just because of some bug either in its installer, so it's not in the registry correctly, or maybe it's a bug in Cam Studio. We actually don't know why it doesn't show up. Uh, we're not sure. Um, all these others are showing up, but, but FFD Show isn't showing up. And our project leader, is, uh, Mix, it's his favorite thing is the FFD Show. And so he's, he has to use an older version himself to use that. But, but it does have... Um, Enough codecs to really get going. You notice there's also H.264 is not in this list. Uh, and that's another um, codec that's really popular with people. And yet if I went back to earlier versions of this uh, 2.6, Bingo shows up. In fact, I even featured that on my, uh, on my site. Let's see. Um, yeah, Cam Studio versions. 
as you see, see there's the, the original, well let's get this to, there we go, original 2.0 version, all of these that are highlighted, they all show up, there's FFD show, XFIT, MPEG4, all these guys show up. Then you have uh, 2.6 and you wind up with three different situations. The uh, R264 showed the FFD show just fine. And the X264 VFW showed up just fine. I mean, this is the same machine. These pictures are taken minutes from each other. Uh, the R273 suddenly lost the uh, it lost FFD show and suddenly lost X264. And same with uh, with this, which gained a couple Intel codecs that didn't even show up over here. So, <laughs> and yet still FFD show and X264 don't show up. So Nick is stuck using R264, which is a little buggy and has a memory leak, but works. It's still stable otherwise. But for his FFD show video codec. <laughs> so there you have it. You know, what can you do? These bugs are being ironed out. We've gotten a bunch of new members on the uh, on the team of people who are doing the uh, programming part of things. I do not do the programming myself. I just do the beta testing and help out on the forum with answering questions. So I guess I'm the help desk guy. Um, but um, they're, we're really getting active right now in terms of uh, everyone's gearing up to squash bugs, uh, upgrading our libraries, um, getting it so hopefully it'll be AVI 2.0 capable pretty soon and um, stuff like that. Um, get rid of the one pixel over bug that's affecting our Windows uh, region thing so that I don't have to have oddball 1279 by 719 window regions selected <laughs> to be able to use the window, uh, the window region right here. Uh, I could get by of course with fixed region I just love the utility of being able to set up a window and use Sizer to uh, to select that window because I use so many different sizes. Um, 856, 855 by 40 is a, is a very good size. Oh, in fact, let's address that for a second. Uh, the the size of your recording issue. Um, the reason why I have this smaller size, uh, which comes out to 856 by 480 uh, in reality, I think. Um, you know, 855 by 40. I got to adjust that bit. This should be saying 479. Um, this size is a, this, the 480 size is the, uh, it's not HD on YouTube, it's SD, or what it's a standard. Um, however, uh, standard definition or no, if you are making a video for the largest size audience and you, you're you not putting it up on YouTube that gives them a downgraded option to watch it at a smaller screen size, um, well, you just got to think, you know, are the people going to be able to watch my 1280 by 720 HD video on their machine? What if they're still running Windows 2000, for goodness sake, an old media player? Um, they've got to be able to to run it. And believe it or not, playing a video is harder on the computer the bigger the screen size is. So, so if this is going out to a large general audience, it's a good idea to start thinking in terms of shrinking down your sizes and not going for HD all the time, unless you're going... To to be outputting your video to a service like YouTube or Vimeo or someone that offers smaller sizes for viewing experience, okay? If I'm going to be packaging this on a disk and putting it into a uh, package of uh, tutorials as a series of tutorials, uh, somebody gets on a DVD or, even, or downloads as a package zipped together, for instance, the better plan is to make it in a smaller size so that they don't have any issues when they try to watch it on their computer. They can still push the full screen button and watch it full screen, but the thing is that the actual data, the actual amount of data in the original is not prohibitive to having it work. Uh, when they go to full screen, they still may experience issues, but now at least when they go to normal size, it's a large enough size 
that it's viewable. It's still at a standard, so it'll appear as one of the 480s at YouTube. It'll be what 480 widescreen, 480p, and uh, and you won't have to worry about them not being able to watch your video, okay? Or if it, you know having so much flashing and really they feel like they're watching an old time movie being cranked. Hey Roger, how you doing? Nice to see you. I've arrived. You have a question? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the story of my life. I, you won't believe how many webinars I get too late. <laughs> but I am recording this, and I'm probably going to put this up as a recording and, uh, and make the link available on the website. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give a link to the recording. It'll be my first use of my S3, uh, my S3 account. So I've had an Amazon S3 account for uh, forever. <laughs> I've got like nothing but JPEGs and GIF files up there for my uh, my WordPress pages. <laughs> That's about it. Finally, I have something viable as you know, an actual video up there that I can share. I may even try to set it up as a streaming thing. It's that I haven't had an excuse to give that a try yet, but uh, I'm going to probably use this as an excuse to try the streaming. But yeah, you'll have a, a recording of the whole thing, and and yeah, we covered a, a ton of stuff. We covered the region stuff. We covered all video options, audio options. Um, now, uh, one thing I did want to cover in terms of the uh, the length of the videos, and one reason besides this window region thing that I really like in this uh, version 2.6 is right down here, automatically stop recording. Let's see, there it is. Automatically stop recording lets you set a setting in seconds where it stops by itself. We were doing all these tests a couple of weeks ago. Um, I just clicked that. You can set a preset time in seconds, and 60 seconds, of course, is going to be one minute. You can't actually type in here. You have to do the little wheel, and it takes off on you. It suddenly starts counting really fast. See? See that? So here I'm trying to get to 600, and it goes. I'll have to jump back and forth to get to 600. There you go. See? Jump past it again. So you just have to realize it's going to do that. So if I want to get 600, which is 10 minutes, which is how I used to have to do everything back in the days when YouTube had this 10-minute limitation, I would set this to 600, have it stop the recording after a period of 600. That way, even if it cut me off mid-sentence, at least I didn't have to worry about going over time, you know. And, uh, and I would push record. It would start recording, record for 10 minutes, and turn itself off. Uh, now that we've discovered that XVID will do long, long recordings, I'm going to eventually find out what the max is there. But the nice thing is you do some tests, uh, find out what your maximum is with whatever codec you're using. Um, you know, pick your codec. Lagareth, XVID, uh, mess around with Huffy, which is very popular. And again, it was what Lagareth was based on. Uh, or Camp Studio, the old standby Camp Studio lossless codec, which is, again, only for tutorial type things like we're doing right now where there's not a lot of high motion on the screen. Lagarus is great for high motion. x is good for both. But, uh, so, do some tests. Find out what your maximums are. Play it safe. Go in and set under automatically stop recording. Set a maximum amount of time. I could think, uh, what we're doing an hour and a half. It was 1,600 minutes. It was, uh, that's, that's an hour and a half, right? Uh, 1,600 seconds. Um, gee, was that right? Wait a minute. <laughs> let's think this through. Oh, yes, calculating. So let's see. Bring up the calculator. So uh, we got an uh, um, hour and a half. That's uh, 90 minutes. 90 times 60 seconds. 5,400. There you go. So that's how long we were doing our test for, for uh, in terms of seconds. And so you would go down here 
and set this to 5400. If you were trying to, if you knew an hour, if, you know, that that was about the maximum you'd be able to reach. Okay. And yes, I was on wireless, so the what can I do? I asked them to climb up on the roof and put the hook up right up to this up upstairs here, but no, you know. So um, there we go. So you get the idea. So yeah, I would set this for fifty-four. I would set it for six thousand if it was more. One twenty seconds. Let's see. One. 20, it's 2 hours, times 60. So if you're thinking of getting 2 hours, set it for 7,200. Get the idea? And then it stops it, and you don't go over time, you don't blow everything up. This, of course, is just after doing a bunch of testing to find out what your maximums really are. Um, what I did to test, when I was running the test for the hour and a half thing, I recorded a webinar, and all I did I had some recordings of webinars, and so all I did was play the webinar back on a loop. I set up the media player to loop, and um, so we'll just keep playing the darn thing over and over again, and then I set the automatically stop recording to the uh, 5400 seconds. And and then when it would turn off, I would see just what kind of damage it had done, and that's how we tested a whole bunch of different codecs. And finally discovered that XFID codec made such tiny file sizes. Um, I haven't tested the XFID with higher motion repeating recording yet, and that would be my next test to see how it fares if I've got an actual game recording or something uh, with a full motion going on in it. Um, that I'm sure I would not get as small a file size as I did using XFID with uh, static material like this. Okay, so let's see, what else did I want to cover? There's other things in here like the screen annotations and stuff, but I've never ever fielded a question about any of this stuff on the forum. Nobody seems to even really care much about that or, or the effects things. You can add a system timestamp so that it's actually putting in a timestamp as you're recording. Like, I... I guess some people would care about showing that. It might be important for a time to everything. A lot of people wonder what the XNote timestamp thing is. That's a program that was written by one of the programmers that's very active in developing Camp Studio. He developed this so that you could actually time events using recordings in conjunction with Camp Studio. You could you could uh, basically record a video playback that was taken at an event and be able to capture finishing times. So times, X note timestamps for doing things like races and stuff like that where you really need for it to get an exact timing of when somebody's completion time was. Okay? And it actually is amazing because it can tell when somebody finished first, what the time was for them finishing first, what the second place uh, winner, what time they came in. Because you set a crossing over point, and it actually times them from that, it gives them a timestamp based on the exact time it took them to, you know, at what point they run, they won from the firing of the gun. Okay. You can add captions and watermarks also. The caption stays on, the watermark stays on, the whole time of the video. So that's what the effects are, and the options is where you set those up as to what files they are and stuff for the watermark and caption and things like that. So, so uh, anyway, we've been running two hours here. Oh, hey, Paul, you got to take off? Um, that's okay. Thanks for sticking by for two hours. Uh, here we go. Um, oh, that's easy. <laughs> We're two easy people, I tell you. There we go. Okay. Now, I'm planning on doing another webinar in probably a couple of weeks. I can't do one uh, next weekend, 
because uh, I'll be out of town. But I'm definitely going to be doing one uh, when I get back. Yeah, without a doubt. You're welcome, Roger. Um, and like I say, I'm going to hopefully have this recording work out, and I'll compress it and everything and upload it. And it'll be my first streaming video. So you know where to go for the uh, the website. Again, it's uh, screencasttutorial.org. Here we go. Zoom in. With two T, screencasttutorial.org, not dot net or dot com. It's dot org. And uh, and it, I'll put that. It'll it's just a WordPress site, so I'll just put it in as a post. And plus, I now have this uh, sign up thing that I just added, and um, it's a new feature I just added last night. It's a sign up for Mayweather. You can sign up for a notifications thing. So anybody that's signed up on this. Uh, I'm going to send out a, bulk, a broadcast email when I'm having a new webinar come up, and it'll uh, it'll probably be after I've already set up the webinar, and it'll have the link right in it, so you can just click the link and go register. All right, cool, huh? So yeah, that's last night's big wowie zowie. I got that done, and uh, so so okay. Well, I hope this was a helpful webinar for everybody, and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm always over at the Camp Studio forums. Um, let me just bring that up. The usual suspects. If you're not been there, you get there. Um, you scroll down, and right there, CampStudio.org forum. And we have a brand new uh, forum design. It's uh, if I got to look, 14 new applicants I got to approve. We have a ton of activity up in here. Where we see yellow, that's new. Those are all the things I'm going to answer after I get off of here. And um, and so, yeah, you can always make posts in here. And I check on this thing every single day, just about, unless I'm having a killer crazy day. And uh, come in and answer everybody's questions. So uh, you're welcome to come on in here to canstudio.org slash forum and, uh, and post away and, and say something about, hey, I saw you at that webinar. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for attending today. Now, Roger, if you've got any questions, you have any specific questions, I'm I'm not in any super screaming rush to go. If you've got a, a question to ask, is there anything specific you needed to know? Since you did get here late, maybe there's something you want to know. Okay. Cool. All right, see you, Paul. Oh, the best codec to yeah, I did spend a good bit of time on this webinar on best codec to use, and what I came down to, pretty much, is to go get this one here. Here it is, Jaworis. Get Jaworis XBID binaries, and that's here. I want to write this down? I'll, and it's at my website too. I've got a whole article on it. Um, See where's my website? Here it is. It's will be the topmost article because I'll be taking down the uh, announcement about the webinar here. See, Jaworis XBID, my newest codec of choice for games, webinars, and tutorials, because it does such a great job of compressing down, especially tutorials, down to like hardly any size at all. Uh, I, we were able to get more than two hours, two and a half hours so far has been the maximum. Uh, I think I can get up to th about three hours uh, before it crashes Camp Studio. It's a lossy codec, so it's not perfect, but you have to realize I'm getting this kind of time out of this XVID codec with a configured even at one, which is the maximum quality, and I'm still getting plenty small uh, videos content. Plenty small. I don't have to. I mean, if I were nervous because I was trying for a two hour and it was, you know, really critical that I get it all, I might set it to two, lose a little bit of quality. I haven't noticed any loss in quality. I did a webinar just the other day. I couldn't see any difference between two and one. So, you know, you can up this quite a bit, obviously, crazy sizes. But so XVID for high motion. Or for low motion, long time is a good choice. 
If you're just going for high motion and the time factor is about 10 minutes is okay, uh, Lagerith Lossless is a great one. And there's like no settings. You just, all the defaults, you just go with the defaults. And um, uh, Lagerith Lossless is really, really good. And it's lossless so that if you had to upscale this video at all, you wouldn't be upscaling um, artifacts and, uh, and lossy types of garbage code, you know, garbage video. Um, it's a lossless codec, just like the Camp Studio lossless codec. But Camp Studio lossless codec is just mainly, it's like a zip file for video. All it does is take any pixels that never change, like none of these pixels that are around here, around the edge, you know, only my mouse is changing, and well, in my screen, my tag cloud down here, um, only my mouse is changing. Everything else is staying still. So it just keeps repeating the same pixel values over and over again. Just says this pixel value doesn't change for such and such a length of time, and that's how it does its compression. It's still doing the keyframes. So uh, set your keyframes if you're going for a lot of time. Set your keyframes to 100 at the most, I would say. 30 is what most people used to say is average. I'm getting great looking video with good enough seek time. Seek time's like the progress bar that you click to, um, when you're watching the video, to jump ahead and go to another spot. If you get this too high, seek time suffers. Uh, but 100, it's still getting that good. I'm getting, uh, because it's only, it's only actually recording a full frame of the image, every hundred frames and the 99 other frames it's just recording what changes you see that's what they mean by keyframe keyframe is the recording of the entire frame and an er and uh, every hundred frames it records the entire frame all the frames in between it only records what changed between in the other 99 frames got it so camp studio is made for that kind of a recording that's got lots of stuff that stays the same. And uh, so, um, so you wouldn't use that for recording a game or for any high motion type of stuff. It stinks for that. Lagerith is lossless also, but it's well adapted to doing predictions and stuff like that, and thus it's good. Also, because you came in late, make sure you keep these two numbers, this and this one. So that when you multiply capture frames every, these two, when you cap, multiply capture frames every times playback rate, it should always equal a thousand or you'll lose your audio sync. So, and this is a terrible setting. A much more viable setting would be, tw um, get out of here, it would be 2050, 2540, see this, well 4025. Um, or even for for screen recordings like this, like a webinar, uh, 10 and 100. See, it's only capturing a, f a frame every 100 seconds. That's capturing any kind of frame. Okay, it's capturing a frame every 100 milliseconds, tenth of a second. And its playback rate is locked in as 10, which is noticeably a little bit jerky to the human eye, but it's smooth enough to be good for webinars and uh, tutorials. If you need smoother, 20 is great, or 25, and you see, but the two still multiplying together still equal 1,000. You've got to keep that. You can't put decimal values in there, so 30 or 15 are out of the question because you can't put a decimal. You need 33.333, or for 15, it would have to be 66.666666, okay? Since you can't put in decimals, you can't even use those. The audio lag the synchronization gets so bad with the audio starting to lag out of sync with the video. It's ridiculous. So there you go. Lagerith, XVID, and Cam Studio Lossless. There's your choices applied to different reasons, uses. Uh, with Lagerith and Cam Studio, different types of lossless codecs for those two different types of uses. And XVID being good for high motion or low motion where you're going to need long, long recordings. Okay? All right. So good, you got that. All right, anything else? Think, think.
All right, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just starting to get to the point where I could definitely use something to drink. This. And uh, I've been going for about two hours here. Well, exactly two hours. Great. Got a little bit of a late start, but um, but uh, I think we got a lot of really good content into this video. And uh, yeah, like I say, um, put your name on that list uh, so you'll know about the next uh, thing. And uh, over here at my new webinars uh, link, so I can notify you the next one. And uh, yeah, and <laughs> and I don't have a way to send a donation yet. <laughs> Um, I also have a regular mailing list in here where I send mailings on different types of items. But this right here, this is just for webinar notifications. Okay, You're right, I need to get a, a PayPal uh, button up there. I mean, as easy as that is, good grief. How many of those I've made, I don't put one on this page. <laughs> so, uh, all right, I promise I will do that next, uh, before midnight tonight. And... Um, uh, but do go ahead and sign up. Like I say, these two lists are not the same. This one over here is a, uh, it's really a lame call to action, if you ask me. I've got to get that improved. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, I do send out occasional emails and announcements. Just that I was also using it to tell people about webinars who ne didn't necessarily need to know. And this way, anybody looking for webinars can find out about it. So... Um, and I'm updating this particular page pretty frequently with, uh, with new articles. So, uh, so definitely keep, keep up with me there. Oh, do, um, send me your, um, send me your email so I can mail you the link to the, uh, well, actually, yeah, sign up to this thing. I'll be sending anybody that signs up to this list here on my page. If you don't want to give me your mail across this thing, uh, I'll be telling anybody that signs up here when I get that link live for the uh, replay. Okay, but I'm always at t t Britain at Gmail. There you go. That's my uh, that's my email t Britain at Gmail dot com, and that's all over the website too. Okay, I believe. Well, it's not, but you can still, you can contact me that way. T. Britain Gmail. Okay. Oh, great. Let me get that down here. Heck, I got, uh, got Evernote open. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, that's CFL. Where's CFL? Here we go. Okay, got it. Ah, yeah, good old Central Florida. All right, thanks for coming up. And, uh, okay, great. Well, if there's nothing more you need to know right now, keep up with me. Like I say, email me anytime. Uh, get up with me on the forums. When it's not, if it's not, you know, urgent or anything, or even if it's not anytime, go ahead and send me info. And uh, I check here every single day, so not a problem. Also, go get free video converter at this site. This is the other things we covered in the, Thing that you missed, get anyvideorecorder.com and you get there by just typing that in any video recorder into Google. Uh, go get Joe Boris XFID binaries. Uh, I think you can get to that by typing XFID. Oops, that's XFID. Yes, indeed. So type Jawar XFID and you go right to that. Um, get your free codecs at Klight and just don't install them all. Just install the 
uh, video for Windows, VFW codecs, and the ACM audio codecs that you need. Don't install everything. For things like Lagerith, uh, Lagerith, you go type Lagerith, L-A-G-A-R-I-T-H. Lagerith codec could download, and it puts him right at the top. Also, go get Sizer. I did a bunch of stuff about this program. This is what allows me to select from this drop-down window various size windows and have it resize automatically to that size window. Okay, or I can instantly rechange re it back to HD 720. Um, so Sizer, you just type in Sizer, <laughs> and bingo, Brian App's link is right at the top. And uh, and go get Zoom it. That's what I've been doing this trick with since uh, Cam Studio doesn't have a built-in Zoom. You download this little teeny weeny file. Look at it, it's not even a meg in size, 267k. And then you configure it and uh, and run it. You, when you run it, it asks you what you want to set the, the keyboard the shortcuts to. Like I'm using a Control Alt Z for Zoom. And uh, you just push it and do that. It will give you one caveat if you if you're going for menus, if you want to drop a menu down, because I use the Alt key. The men, Alt key will close by darn menu. So do your Control Alt, then open the menu, holding down the mouse, and then zoom in, and uh, let go, and it'll do its thing. Okay. I probably could pick something better, like Control Shift Z or something. Wouldn't give me that problem. Um, but yeah, zoom it. And again, this is the same story. Go ahead, type zoom it, Z O O M I T into Google. It'll be the first thing at the top. And uh, Mark Sonovich, this is a Microsoft TechNet download for free. And so, so that's the big deals. I got K-Lite Mega. And by the way, I got the Mega because it is it has the um, it has all the producers codecs. So K-Lite Mega Pack, K-Lite Codec Pack Mega. This has all of the production codecs. The basic and standard only have the playback codecs. But like I say, go get Lagareth, go get Jawar's XVID because it's superior in some ways to um, the stock one from XVID.org. Go get the Any Video Recorder, um, Zoom it, uh, Lagareth Lossless, go get that from the, from the source, the guy that makes it. And one thing I mentioned was how um, Jawar has the uh, XVID binaries. They come in 64-bit and 32-bit. Even if you've got a 64-bit machine, install them both. Don't just install the 64-bit because most of the programs you're going to use for production and many for playback, even on a 64-bit machine, are going to be 32-bit programs. They won't be able to use the 64-bit codec. Okay. All right, boy, I think I've already, f I just gave you the whole two-hour webinar in a, a minute and 30 seconds. How <laughs> do you like that? <laughs> think of all the time you saved. <laughs> okay, well, then I'm going to go and get myself a nice tall lemonade. And, heck, that's what I would be doing if I were in Florida, too. <laughs> okay, thanks, Raj. And, uh... Yeah, we'll stay in touch, and uh, I guess I'm going to close this thing down, and uh, yeah, please, be in touch, okay? And anybody wants to uh, get, get a hold of me, it's tbritton at gmail.com, or you can get hold of me again through the Camp Studio support forum at campstudio.org slash forum, okay? All right, well, have a great day. And thanks a lot for attending the webinar. Take care. <laughs>